If you were given the opportunity to describe human existence in 90 minutes, what would you share? Your message will last for a billion years, long after our species is gone, drifting out through space, waiting to be found by something out there. And I want you to really think about it. Would you highlight our moments of peace, love, and togetherness? Or would you be honest with the level of violence that's marked our history? What kind of music would you share? How would you demonstrate the diversity in our people, our religions, and our languages? You have 115 pictures. How are you going to choose what will immortalize humans and the planet that was Earth forever? This was a question asked to Carl Sagan and his team in 1977 when they were tasked with creating a time capsule depicting the human species for a faraway extraterrestrial civilization. And their answers are now a part of what is known as the Golden Records attached to NASA's Voyager 1 and 2, 23.5 billion kilometers away from Earth, the most distant man-made object in space. The Golden Record consists of 115 analog encoded photographs, a 12-minute montage of sounds on Earth, 90 minutes of music, and greetings in 55 languages, including the now famous Hello from the children of planet Earth. And finally, a message from U.S. President Jimmy Carter that says, This is a present from a small, distant world. A token of our sounds, our science, our images, our music, our thoughts, and our feelings. We are attempting to survive our time so that we may live into yours. We hope someday, having solved the problems we face, to join a community of galactic civilizations. This record represents our hope and our determination and our goodwill in a vast and awesome universe. If you want to see what else is on the record, let me know, and I'd appreciate it if you followed along. Thank you. Falling in and out of love are such integral parts of the human condition, so it only seems fitting, in some weird cosmic way, that the time capsule meant to represent humanity for billions of years, sailing through the universe, would in itself create and capture a love story. Andrew Yan was on the recording team for the Voyager 1 spacecraft, and had the idea to record someone's brainwaves on an EEG machine, in the hopes that some highly advanced technology billions of light years away would be able to actually decipher human thoughts. The team liked her idea, and volunteered her to provide the brainwaves that would be immortalized forever. The EEG was scheduled for June 3rd, 1977, and Anne had a script prepared for ideas and history she had hoped to perpetuate. But only two days before, she shared a phone call with Carl Sagan, the chair of the Voyager 1 committee, where they had a eureka moment, confessed their love for each other, and decided to get married. So two days later on June 3rd, even though Anne's conscious mind was focused on the script in front of her, her subconscious, and I quote, was buzzing with the euphoria of the great idea of true love, electronically compressed down into one single minute that sounded like a string of exploding fireworks. What I often think is that maybe a hundred million years from now, you know, somebody flags that record down. And I always wonder, because part of what I was thinking in this meditation was about the wonder of love and of being in love and to know it's on those two spacecraft. Even now, in my, whenever I'm down, you know, I'm thinking, and still they move 35,000 miles an hour, leaving our solar system for the great wide open sea of interstellar space. If aliens ever do find one of the Voyagers and decipher its contents, they will briefly meet dozens of musicians, artists, whales, dogs, crickets, engineers, and common working people. But the one who they might have a chance to truly get to know is the young woman in love. That is all for this video, but as always, if this interested you and you want to see more like it, I'd really appreciate it if you followed along. Thank you. There are 10,000 stars in our universe for every single grain of sand here on Earth. And on average, each one of those stars has at least one planet. The observable universe is about 90 billion light years in diameter, with 100 billion galaxies, each with 100 to 1,000 billion stars. And there are probably trillions of habitable planets in the universe, which means there should be lots of opportunity for life to develop and exist. So where is everybody? This is a question that was originally proposed by physicist Enrico Fermi in 1950, later dubbed the Fermi Paradox. And the more you look into it, the weirder it gets. In the Milky Way alone, there are about 200 billion sun-like stars. And it's estimated about a fifth of them have an Earth-like planet in its habitable zone. If only 0.1% of those planets harbored life, there would be 1 million planets with life in the Milky Way galaxy alone. Not only that, but Earth is still relatively young, so there would have been billions of years for one of those planets to develop an advanced civilization capable of space travel before we even showed up. Now, to put that into perspective for you, if we could build generational spacecrafts that could sustain a population for a thousand years, we could colonize the entire Milky Way in about two million years. Which might sound like a long time, but one, we're talking about two million of billions and billions of years, and two, the Milky Way is huge. So theoretically, there's been enough time for this to have happened already, but it hasn't. So why? Which is where the great filter comes in, which I'm going to talk about in the next part. If that interests you, I'd really appreciate if you followed along. Thank you. The universe should be packed with advanced alien civilizations, but it isn't. So why is that? Well, the most common answer to this is known as the great filter, and it comes in various degrees of scary. To understand it, you first need to understand that we really have no clue what the process or conditions are that allow for complex life to develop. And it could be a lot more complicated than we could ever imagine, which is a good thing for us because it could mean that we've already passed through the great filter and the worst is behind us. It could also mean that the universe was too hot and inhospitable for life until 
until recently, which might make us the very first advanced civilization in the entire universe. Go us. <laughs> the bad news is that the Great Filter might still be in front of us. Life at our level exists everywhere in the universe, but it gets destroyed when it reaches a certain point that lies ahead of us, most likely due to technology of our own invention. If this is true, that means we're closer to the end than to the beginning of human existence. And the last possible solution to this is that there could already be an advanced ancient galactic civilization that monitors the universe, and once a civilization is advanced enough, they're either let in or removed completely. So I will leave you with a quote from Arthur Clarke. Two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. That is all for this video, but if this interested you and you want to see more like it, I'd really appreciate if you followed along. Thank you. Imagine that I dropped you in the middle of a very dark forest with only one rule, to survive as long as possible. To accomplish this, you're going to do whatever it takes, including eliminating any threat you come across before it eliminates you. You know that there might be others like you in this forest, but you have to assume that they're going to do whatever it takes to survive, just the same as you. So if you come across each other, either accidentally or on purpose, you might find yourself in a situation where neither of you can truly know what the other's intentions are. You don't know if they mean harm to you or not, but what you do know is that if you shoot first, they won't have the opportunity to, which makes it the safest course of action. This is a solution to the Fermi paradox known as the Dark Forest, a theoretical warning that we shouldn't be looking for aliens at all, because if we came across them, neither species would know if the other came in peace. The Dark Forest theory makes any civilization in our universe a threat to every other civilization, and could explain why the universe is so quiet, because there are only two kinds of them out there, the quiet ones and the dead ones. There are 10,000 stars in our universe for every grain of sand here on Earth. Every star has at least one planet on average, and billions if not trillions of those planets rotate in the habitable zone. So it seems like the universe should be packed with alien life, except we see none of them. So why is that? Well, one of the potential reasons can be answered by looking at human progress. As we've matured as a species, we've become increasingly less violent and a lot more peaceful. And I know it might not always seem like it, and there's still a lot of conflict in the world, but we're closer than ever to actually achieving world peace. And if there is a correlation between progress and peacefulness, it's safe to assume that an advanced alien civilization with the technology to detect us is waiting, observing, and hiding from us until we've reached a certain level. It's very human of us to assume that we would be the center of attention of some multi-civilization universe, but just how we don't concern ourselves with the business of ants, aliens might not concern themselves with this primitive planet either. If there are aliens out in the universe and they're observing us, do you know what they would see? Well, if those aliens are living 80 light years away from Earth, World War II is still happening. If they're living 65 million light years away, dinosaurs are still walking around. And if those aliens are living 4.6 billion light years away, our solar system hasn't even formed yet. Now, 4.6 billion light years is an insanely far distance, but the universe itself is 93 billion light years across, which means that if there is intelligent life out in the universe, 95% of the places they could be, from their perspective, Earth hasn't even formed yet. Now, down here on Earth, we have been sending out radio signals letting the universe know that we're here since 1974, and they've only made it about this far in our galaxy, so there is still a lot of searching left to do. The largest thing in the entire known universe is called the Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall, and it is eight times bigger than what the laws of physics say should be the maximum in our universe. This thing is 10 billion light years across, and to put that into perspective a little bit, the universe is only about 13.8 billion years old, and Earth is about 4.5 billion. So the light that entered the Great Wall at the same time as Earth was being formed hasn't even made it halfway through yet. This structure is known as a galactic filament, a vast group of galaxies all stuck together by gravity, and it's baffled scientists for the past 10 years because we have no idea how something this large could have evolved, which is another reminder of how much we do not know. Humans are not an advanced species, not by a long shot. On the Kardashev scale for ranking advanced civilizations, we only get a whopping 0.72, but there is an area in space known as the Great Void. At nearly 300 million light years in diameter, it is the largest known void in the entire universe. Only 60 galaxies have been discovered in the void, when scientists estimate there should be at least 2,000 of them. So, is this the home of the most advanced species in our universe? You see, on the Kardashev scale, a Type 1 civilization is also known as a planetary civilization. Type 1s are able to store and use all of the energy that reaches them from their host star. They are able to influence the weather, change the geological makeup of the planet, and much, much more. It's predicted that we will reach Type 1 in the next 100 to 200 years. Type 2s, also known as stellar civilizations, can control the total energy of its host star and transfer that throughout the solar system, hypothetically through devices like Dyson spheres. There would be asteroid mining, massive structures, multiple home planets, all throughout the solar neighborhood. Type 3s are 
known as galactic civilizations, and they control the total energy of its entire host galaxy and all of its billions of stars. But the crazy part about type threes is that if they did exist, they probably wouldn't be noticeable at all because all of the energy and light from the stars would be held and used. So to an outside observer, there might be a hole in the galaxy or nothing at all, just like the great void. That is all for this video, but if this interested you and you wanna see more like it, I'd really appreciate if you click the plus, thank you. So unfortunately, NASA says we won't be a type one civilization until the year 2371. We currently sit at a 0.73 on the Kardashev scale, which is a theoretical method for ranking civilizations based on their technological achievements and energy consumption. Being a type one would mean that we are able to harness 100% of the Earth's renewable energy through wind, water, and solar. Even natural disasters like tsunamis and earthquakes would be generating energy for us. We would have complete control over the climate, could regulate global temperatures, terraform parts of our own planet and places like Mars and Venus. And the best part is that we would have so much energy that it would most likely be free. Now, the only catch is that we actually have to make it to the 24th century in the first place. So unfortunately, NASA doesn't think we'll be a type two civilization until the year 3200. But what would that look like? Well, type twos can be broken down into four categories, energy, transportation, communication, and society. Type twos have access to 100% of the energy of their home planet and star, giving them access to 100% unlimited energy. This would enable us to have control over the weather, eliminate famine and drought, and have complete mastery over our natural resources. We would have moved beyond traditional methods of transportation and develop technologies like faster than light travel or teleportation, allowing us to easily travel between different planets and galaxies. We would have also mastered advanced forms of communication like telepathy, and we would be able to communicate instantaneously across vast distances. And finally, within society, we would have achieved a state of global unity and cooperation with a focus on betterment for all life forms. It would be an era of post-scarcity where basic needs are easily met and resources are abundant. Now, as a reminder, this is all hypothetical and the Kardashev scale is mainly there for inspiration of everything that we could achieve, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. I want you to stop what you're doing and come back in time with me. It's July 20th, 1969, and Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were just the first humans ever to step on the moon, if you believe in that stuff. <laughs> if you ask anyone who's alive at the time, they would tell you that down here on Earth, it was euphoric, and over 650 million people tuned in and celebrated man's greatest achievement. And sometime next decade, we're gonna do it again when we send humans to Mars to set up humanity's first, but hopefully not last, off-planet colony. It's pretty crazy if you think about it. A few hundred thousand years ago, we gained consciousness and have questioned the nature of our universe and our place in it ever since. As we got older, we realized how insignificant we are in the grand scheme of things, but we still wanted to reach out into it. And since we're natural explorers, it only makes sense that we continue to do so while we have the opportunity. And Mars is just the first step. Now, you might be thinking, what about world hunger or homelessness or climate change? Shouldn't we try and save this planet before we set up shop on another? Well, the answer is complicated because obviously these are extremely important issues that we need to focus on. But if we spend every minute and every dollar to try and solve them over the next 50 years just to get wiped out by a super volcano, what was the point? You see, if the history of the universe was put into a 24 hour clock, the human species showed up at 1159.59. We've only been around for one whole second. In one second, we discovered electricity, landed on the moon, invented the internet, and looked as far as we can out into the universe. Now, imagine what we could do with a minute. That is all for this video, but if this interested you and you want to see more like it, I'd really appreciate if you followed along. Thank you. If we're going to do some colonizing, is Venus the better choice? You see, our solar system used to have three habitable planets, Earth, Mars, and Venus. And the mainstream conversation recently has been about getting humans to and colonizing Mars. But Mars is far, has half the gravity than Earth, no atmosphere, solar storms, crazy high levels of radiation, and it's freezing cold, which is not really a very comfortable place for anyone to live. But Venus, on the other hand, might actually be a much better option, and it's a lot closer. About 50 kilometers up from its surface, there's an airspace with similar gravity, pressure, and solar radiation to Earth, and its temperature ranges from about 30 to 50 degrees Celsius. Now, the catch is that we'd have to live in floating cities that stayed within this airspace, but it is actually pretty feasible, which is why NASA released their Havoc concept back in 2015, which would be a 30-day manned mission floating through Venus's atmosphere. So while you or I might never be living in the skies of Venus, our grandchildren just might be. If we can prove that life has or currently exists somewhere else in our solar system, then it basically confirms the trillions of different alien life forms that could possibly exist in our universe. We know that Mars was once a habitable planet billions of years ago, with lakes, rivers, and an atmosphere to keep things comfortable. There are also reservoirs of liquid water under the surface, where some scientists are hopeful that we might find living bacteria. Europa is one of Jupiter's 80 moons covered in a shell of ice 10 to 15 miles thick, covering up a heated ocean with tidal forces keeping the water in motion. Scientists say all of the ingredients for life are there, and a spacecraft to study the moon will arrive there in 2030. Titan is Saturn's largest moon and has one of the most robust atmospheres in our solar system. It is beaming with different bodies of liquid and rich in organic materials. Just last month, the James Webb Telescope got pictures of the moon showing that it has clouds and rain, and scientists say the essential chemical building blocks for life are present
present in the atmosphere. NASA's Dragonfly mission is expected to reach and study Titan in 2034. Saturn's sixth largest moon, Enceladus, contains a global saltwater ocean covered by a layer of clean ice. NASA has also found evidence of hydrothermal activity deep underground, which could provide a source of heat necessary for life to evolve. But there are six other places that scientists are looking for life in our solar system, so let me know if you guys want. Our relationship with the moon has always been a really important one. It controls the tides, which have guided humans for thousands of years. It will be our trampoline for space exploration, and it gives us our seasons, leading scientists to believe it was a key factor in Earth being suitable for life. Where the moon actually came from is still a mystery, especially since it has a very similar composition to Earth and it orbits us unusually close. But the leading theory is known as the giant impact hypothesis. 4.4 billion years ago, in the very early days of our solar system, Earth actually had a smaller sister planet known as Theia. The two planets lived side by side for years, until one day Earth's gravity pulled Theia in, smashing the two together. This completely obliterated Theia and took off a huge chunk of Earth, and the remains of both planets came together to form what is now our moon. This also permanently tilted Earth, which is why we rotate on an axis giving us our seasons, and while it's still unproven, scientists think Theia's remains could be hidden under West Africa in the Pacific Ocean. One of the greatest mysteries of our solar system is whether Planet Nine actually exists or not, and for the first time in 150 years, we now have some pretty strong evidence to confirm that it does. If you're not familiar with Planet Nine, it is a mysterious hypothetical planet 10 times larger than Earth at the edge of our solar system about 20 times the distance of Neptune. Now, we can't see Planet Nine, which is why it's hypothetical, but the reason that we think it's there is because of a strong gravitational force on a number of smaller objects that we can see. And to give you an idea of just how far away this thing is, Pluto is about 3 billion miles away from Earth, and it's estimated that Planet Nine is about 42 billion miles away. But every year, the hypothetical planet becomes closer to being a reality, and Mike Brown, who's an astronomer at the California Institute of Technology, thinks it is just one or two years away from being found, which is just another reminder of how much we don't know about our universe. This robotic snake might be the first contact humanity has with extraterrestrial life. The Exobiology Extent Life Surveyor, or EELS for short, is a snake-shaped robot currently in development with the goal of searching for life on the icy moon of Saturn. In September of 2017, the Cassini probe fell into Saturn's atmosphere and burned up after 13 years of exploring the planet, but during its mission, it discovered that Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons, was completely covered in ice and had plumes of water shooting out of it, most likely from geothermal activity. And where there is water and heat, there might be life, so we're gonna go look. But the problem is that Enceladus is far, cold, and there are a lot of unknowns about the terrain, but the team hopes to have the EELS robot finished by late 2024 and then propose their mission to NASA. And if they find some sort of alien fish down there, that would all but guarantee that our universe is packed with life. We might have just found a secret ocean on another one of Saturn's moons. Could it contain some sort of life? Now, this moon shouldn't even exist in the first place because at one point it was hit by an asteroid so big it almost completely ripped the moon apart, making it look like the real life Death Star. So why do we think that this moon might actually harbor life? And what would it mean for the number of potentially habitable worlds in our universe? Well, it was once thought that a planet or moon needed to have liquid water on its surface to sustain life, meaning it had to be within a certain range of its host star. But one of the most profound discoveries this century was that underground heated oceans exist in the far reaches of our solar system. But what makes Mimas special compared to something like Enceladus is that its surface doesn't give its ocean away. It has a specific wobble that we generally attribute to geothermal activity. And if Mimas does have a secret ocean, that means there could be a lot more stealth ocean worlds than we previously thought. Why do former astronauts say it should be a requirement for every world leader to be sent up into space? Space travel is one of the most defining and exciting industries of the 21st century. But sending people up into space also comes with a really surprising benefit, one that a lot of astronauts think could benefit the world as a whole. Looking back down on Earth from space causes a major cognitive shift in a ton of astronauts who describe it as a state of awe with self-transcendent qualities, which basically means that seeing Earth from that perspective can overwhelm people with emotion and have a major impact on their identity, making them feel more connected to other people and the planet and more appreciative of what we get to call home. It's called the overview effect and can completely and permanently change someone's value system, creating a sense of togetherness and care that every world leader should probably have. 